just want to be really, really careful in this moment. Um, so I want you guys to know that it's kind of like when you know God's getting ready to do something and you want to be there in the middle, middle of it and you're scared half to death at the exact same time. Um, this has been such a powerful year and I don't know if how many of you have seen that. I know some of you heard things and new things were coming and some of you haven't gotten on the wave of it yet because you got punched in the gut when, to start the year. This weekend, I was able to take a handful of everyday people with me up to Atascadero. We got invited to just minister, and I wanted people out of out of our community to go that we can show who we are, you know, that we're kind of normal, we're non-hype, we're not into exaggeration, but we totally believe that God's going to move, you know. And all night, we watched people get healed. We saw demons leaving people. We had three little girls who were with us out of our children's ministry, and I watched a five-year-old uh, prophesy, I watched a seven-year-old prophesy, I watched an eight-year-old prophesy over this man, and he crashed to the ground. He was six foot five, and he crashed under the power and the love of God. And when God does stuff like that, it's just kind of like a reckoning, because it's like, these people were like, what is going on? Because they're not used to seeing stuff like that. But sometimes we get out of practice and we kind of get in, you know, sometimes we get in a rut and we're not seeing those things. We forget who we are. It was a great, it was a great reminder, I think, for a few people that this is absolutely who we are. Um, over the past several weeks, and, and I'll go all the way back months, um, David Wagner was here. He, he, I was sitting in here next to my wife, and he gave this word about we're in a Kairos moment. And I was like, look at my phone. And I pushed it over because me and Mark and Rich have been texting earlier in the week, and that's what we had actually felt that exact same week. We've stepped into it. But sometimes when people declare things and say things, and you're like, nothing changed. So was that really something? Was that really God? Whatever. You know, that's kind of what happens with people. A lot of times we're just, we're waiting on God to do one more thing. I saw a word this week that says when the Kansas City Chiefs win the, if they win the NFL championship, that's when revival is going to come. And I'm like, dude, I don't want to, I don't want to wait on the Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> I figure if we're adding an and or a but or anything onto God moving, then that's where we're wrong. Because he doesn't, Jesus has done everything, you know. Um, I'm, I, I appreciate the faith moments when God says, when people say th different things, but there's nothing stopping us from entering in and watching God do things. Over the past several weeks, as we've been sharing, um, that God's doing something and he's moving and, it's, it's, it, and everything has changed but nothing has changed. That's what you'd kind of feel like that tension is. And people look at you like you're crazy until you just go to them and you're like, let me just pray for you. And then God just, in one minute, I've watched it countless times over the last few weeks, in one minute I see people getting up and they're like, I'm back. I don't know what happened before that moment, but I'm back and it's, it's all different and it's all changed. In the sewing series that we're in right now, it's probably not a series that, that a lot of us, because sometimes I'll come in here, and if we can talk about the elephant in the room, can we talk about the elephant in the room? Because sometimes we come in here on the weekends, and honestly, it feels like there's a lot of fatigue in the room. It feels like some, in some cases our expectation has lowered. And it's not, in a, it's not speaking in judgment. Listen, it happens because life happens, and it's hard. And, we've, and sometimes you just got to remember that we're connected to the source. So instead of just giving you a message today, what we're going to do is I'm going to share something really quickly, and we're going to stay in worship, we're going to stay in this moment, and we're going to watch people come into an encounter with God. Does that sound good for you? So if we can light this up on the screen in Luke 5, 1 through 7. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of uh, Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God, and he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets, and he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked, um, asked him to put out a little from the shore. And then he sat down, and he, and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've toiled all night and haven't caught anything. And it's like in this moment, um, 
you know, you got to think about, if, if you know anything about fishing, I don't, I'm terrible at it. That's pretty much the story of my life when I go fishing is I never catch anything. But these guys are professionals. They've been doing it their whole life. They know this lake. It's not like a, they call it the Sea of Galilee, but it's a lake. And, he, and they fish all night long where you're supposed to fish at night. And so by the time they get out, they're pulling seaweed, they're pulling junk out, and the nets are already ripped up. Whatever happened when they were trying to do their stuff, um, it, you know, they were done. And instead, this teacher comes up, and he's hanging out around the sea, and he, he uses one of their boats, and he gives like the worst fishing advice of all time. As he says, here's what I want you to do. Why don't you just go right back in your boat after you've already dragged your nets everywhere and everything else, and I want you to pull them in the boat, and you're going to bring them into the boat with you, and you're going to go out into the deep water, and you're going to try again. Now, I think, I think Simon's being pretty polite here because he's just kind of like, all right, you're a really good teacher, but you suck at fishing. I know that that's probably what was in his heart because... He made it really abundantly clear when he says we toiled all night. Now, we see that word toiled in other scriptures, and sometimes toiled just means we worked really hard. That's not what the context of this is. What he's saying is, is that we are tired, we are exhausted, we are defeated, and you're telling us to do something unreasonable because we've fished these waters our whole life. This is our family business. We know this water. We know how it goes. We're counting our losses. We're not quitting all. We're not completely quitting, but we're, we're done. And we're not going out there again. Two quick personal stories, and, and then we're going to watch what God does, okay? One of them that's very recent, and one of them that was from, from some years ago. I'm sorry. I'm not. Well, my, my daughters always want to see me cry, and I never do, so don't tell them. Um, um, my wife and I, when we got married, we, we started out. I mean, we, we've never had marriage problems. We've always had an amazing marriage, and God's done really cool stuff. But we've also dealt with a lot of, like, really hard stuff multiple tragedies. We lost three, uh, three babies in miscarriage, um, chronic illness. There was a lot of stuff, and it came all the way up to the point where she almost died. We were living in Florida. I was on staff at a really big church. God was moving, doing all kinds of stuff, and it's like in a moment's time, I go from being plucked out of doing ministry to just being by her side, completely alone, because we moved to Florida, and there was nobody that we knew down there, because we're like that. We're just people who are like, hey, we're all in. Let's just go do something crazy, and that's what we do, you know? But we get there and we're alone, and there's nothing more humbling than when you are just trying to pray for the lung capacity to be there. Like you just can't, you know, you can't sleep, you can't, you know, it's just, I like walking around, but I hear that thing and people are like, that's an annoying sound. Um, so anyway, you're just praying all night and you're just hoping for something to change and it's not really changing. And you're around a bunch of people who've quit praying for you because they're so defeated by it. And I just remember telling God, I was like, you know, when we get out of here, two things, family's going to be number one priority, and the second thing is we're never going to do ministry the same way again. And my wife does get out of there, and we move all the way to California because we were like, there was a couple of things about San Diego, and we wanted to move to California because we thought, oh, well, we'll get better medical treatment there. See, I believed in Holy Spirit, but I was already, like, giving up on promises. I was already kind of withdrawing. And I'm just like, yeah, maybe we can get there. It'll be better weather, and, it'll, and she'll get better medical treatment. So we moved to San Diego. Um, I, went, I went to work for a great church out there. It was a really large church, and it seemed really secure and everything. Except the craziest thing is that everybody knows what happened in like 2006, 2007, 2008. We don't want to remember those days, but they were terrible days. And I was a casualty. I was laid off with a third of the staff because I was a brand new guy. So here I am moving. My wife's sick. I'm not going to have health care for her because Obamacare hadn't passed yet. And we're like, what are we going to do? Now we knew it's, it was crazy too to go from having a resume where like everybody wants you to now I'm expendable. Is that really like I wasn't even worth keeping, you know? So there's all of these things, the performance stuff, all the stuff of the years, because we hadn't really seen God do anything super cool in a long time. And um, a guy in San Diego, he's a past, he was a pastor of one of the vineyard churches. He asked me to go to one of their conferences, and I go. 
And I was a little bit arrogant, even though I had nothing to be arrogant about, that I walk in there and I'm like, these people got lost in 1984. Like, it was like a lot of people trying to dress like John Wimber, except there was no presence and power of God in the place. I mean, I'm not saying anything ugly. I'm just talking about the moment that it was in. And I was so annoyed of worship that I would walk out of worship and I would sit in the front area. Like, I can't even take listening to their worship right now. Like, I just, you know. uh, And I remember I was stuck up there because I'd gotten a ride because we were broke and I was staying in a hotel room with these guys who were snoring and had stinky feet and it was like the worst experience ever. And I remember calling my wife and I was like, listen, babe, it looks like I've got a ride. This conference has been a complete wash. I just want to get home. Sorry that it kept me away from you and the kids, whatever, you know. And, and so we're supposed to leave and then the lady who's giving me a ride back says, I think I'm going to stay tonight and listen to Bob Ober." And inside me, I was like, who the hell is Bob Ober? (laughs) But I was like, okay. And so I called my wife back. Sorry if that offended anybody. We've got bigger problems than me saying H-E double hockey sticks, I think. (laughs) If we're honest. And uh, I mean, the thing is, is that my wife, uh, I told her, I was like, I'm not going to be home till late now. And so I'm stuck and I've got a terrible attitude. And this guy gets up there and he speaks. Except he had an actual vibrant relationship with God and the crazy Jesus stories hadn't really stopped for him. And he told countless stories of babies that were dead in the womb for weeks that had been resurrected. He talked about going into drug clinics in in, uh, Mexico and all of these people getting completely like no no, um, side effects, completely being off drugs. Like just crazy story after story. And those were important for me to see, but the other thing that he talked about was the love of the Father, and I'd never heard that message. You know, for me, it was just performance and work really hard, and then God will bless you, and if if God's happy, you are getting blessed, you know? It's kind of the way that I thought that it added up. Well, long story short was, um, I go up at the end, and I'm like, well, I'm interested in this Father's love business. Let's see, let's give it a go, you know? I didn't say give it a go back then. You can tell I've changed the story since I have British people that I work with now, but... And my daughter watches Peppa Pig, but um, I was like, so let's, let me just go try and say, pray, you know, and I got goose pimples, but whatever. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. All I knew is whenever I saw that guy, Bob, praying over people, he had like a line of people who were just falling on the ground. And I'm like, that's interesting. At least it's easy to find them. You can follow the trail of bodies and you can find them. And I'm just so desperate because I need my wife. Like, it was like, when you, when you go down to like nothing, and you have like nothing, and that's really where I was. It was like, you know, I've got Jesus and I've got my wife. And I'd quit on Jesus if I could, but I'd seen too much and where am I gonna go? We were there for a reason. We knew that we were, but we were toast. And I go up to him and I'm like, listen, Bob, I know you don't know me. We moved all the way out here because God called us out here. Now I'm laid off, my wife's super sick. We're about to go homeless, we did go homeless. And um, I'm like, we just, I said, I have enough faith. I know you're busy. You can just call her over the phone and pray for her. And he was like, he's like, I go through San Diego sometimes. I'll come by and actually pray personally for your wife. But God's not done with you. Let me pray for you. You know what it was? It was the Jesus one more time. And I'm like, whatever. Like, if it makes you feel good, you can pray for me. That's really, that's, I did not have any faith. I didn't have any, anything, because I didn't have anything left. I'm like, okay, if he wants to pray for me, all right. And he prays for me, and he didn't say any particular, he wasn't even good at praying. Like, you talk to some people, and you're like, this was, like real, this was God's word. It's kind of like when Rich or Rachel prophesy, and you hear a British accent, you're like, that's exactly what Jesus sounds like, because it's the movies we watch, you know? And, but this guy wasn't even good at praying, and I had no faith. But God seemed to... Now, a lot of times we leave, we make a lot of preconditions before God can do things, and I had none, and God just showed up, and he met me in that place, and, and I can't even, if I described in full detail, it would scare some of you people, but all I can say is it felt like the weight of all of this stuff that had been, I mean, it's like it was literally tied to my spine, just got ripped off of me, and I was destroyed and, and ruined in the best way possible. And I remember that woman, Marie, when she was driving home, she was like, ooh, God got you, didn't you? Because I couldn't walk, I could barely walk out of the place. And, uh, 
I get home and I tell my wife, and I'm trembling for days after this encounter, and I prayed for my wife, and you know what, nothing happened. She was like, well, you know, I don't feel any different. And I was like, maybe your body doesn't know yet. I don't know, like, I don't know how this stuff works. Six months later, my life was radically healed by God. Went from 13 medications a day to running up the beach and climbing up the cliffs, and our life was given back to us. And I am unwilling to ever settle for a, a life less than the full power of God. Because what happens is that when the enemy comes and things happen and things squeeze on you and everything else, you start making concessions in your life. And you, and you start even making up theology. And let me tell you, if you're in a crappy place, place that's the worst place to try to develop theology. Because God does less and less and you, and you concede more and more to the enemy. And before long, you realize that you are completely working in your own strength. You start doing things that mere mortals can do. And Christian life was never meant to be, it was never meant to be hard. It was meant to be impossible. And if we have stopped confronting the possibilities, then we're in toil. It's that, it's that simple. Because I can't, I can't heal somebody. I can't muster up the strength of healing somebody. It doesn't matter what's going on. I don't have it. So it's impossible. Everything's impossible, though. God didn't, Jesus didn't die on the cross and, and rob and bankrupt hell so that we could just have good character. You know, if all Jesus gave us was forgiveness of sins, that would be fine, but it was so much more than that. And some of us know that we're living below that. Back some months ago, um, if you, it, and Mark has always been, and, um, and Mark, I'm sure, is going to share a lot of things over the next few weeks, but I've, I've got to tie this back to Mark, as I said, personal story and recent one. And um, I know a lot of you don't know that Mark's pastored this church, and he's led, and all of this stuff, and, and it doesn't look like he's dropping the ball with anything. He's just doing it, and he's Mark. Um, but I also know that he's been basically the hospice caregiver for his mom for a really long time. And I don't know that most of you know that. And you don't know, like, I know what it's like to be next to someone who's chronically ill and you have to do things for them and everything else, and you don't get any downtime. Um, you guys know some weeks back that, um, that it looked like she was going to pass, and, and a lot of you were praying. I went to the hospital. I saw Mark in that moment. And see, all the people in the hospital, because the hospital's the worst place to pray, because there's no faith there, and there's all kinds of junk, and it's dark, and it's, there's people who don't care, and it's just weird, and uh, it's a, it was a very, I mean, it was beyond bleak when I walked in the door, and um, I watched Mark, regardless if he was exhausted or anything else, with back, back against the wall, he said, we're going to go after this thing. And I went, and at the same time, there were a lot of other people praying, and I know other people visited, but I just stood, stood, stood um, by his side, and we just prayed, and there was this faith that was released, and there was this thing that happened in an impossible moment, and then she's out of the hospital a few days later. I told Mark this week, but I, I think that every one of you need to know that when Mark had his back against the wall, he planted a seed. And that's what God calls us to do because everything's impossible. Everything's impossible. It doesn't matter what you believe and what kind of momentum that you bring into the season or no momentum. It makes no difference to God. Because I'm telling you that there are some times that God, all he needs to do is for us to say, give us the word. Now, if I show you on the scripture, this is what he said on the next verse. Simon answered, he said, Master, we've toiled all night and haven't caught anything. Nevertheless, at your word, because you say so, I will let down the nets. It's this word, and, and when it's translated, it's tra translated rhema, and people have a discussion on whether that's different than the logos word, which is the written word of God. Here's what I'd say. Whenever God speaks, that word has, its has the power in itself to do and accomplish anything that needs to be done. And it will override everything that's going on in your life, but it's one of those things that you just have to respond to, that you have to move into that moment. It's not requiring extraordinary faith of you to figure out your theology or any of those other kinds of things, but back against the wall, what do we do? We step forward. 
we're about to hit the greatest season this church has ever seen. We are going to see things rock and it is going to shake and it's going to drop people's jaws. And we cannot settle for less than that. You know some of you have seen way too much. Listen, if you, if you thought that it was impossible to see those things again, some of you grew up in the Jesus movement and everything else, then what I would say is, hey, you're toiling because he hasn't changed. And maybe you need that touch to be relaunched today. Here's how you can tell if you're in toil. If you can go back to a place where you are more aware of the presence of God than you are right now, then you're probably toiling. It's working within your own strength. If you can go back to a place where you were closer to God, if you can go back to a place when you heard God's voice more clearly than you do right now, you're probably toiling. If you can go back to a place where you had more hope and you have more faith, then you're toiling. If right now this season feels fruitless, that you can look over the last year or two of your life and you're like, man, what did I even get done? What's even being accomplished? Does it even matter anymore? Then you're toiling and God's in inviting you out of toil and back into fruitfulness because it's on Him. See, when you're connected to the source, the fruit is of the Spirit, right? If you look in your life and you don't see fruit of the Spirit, if you don't see, you can't see, I'm more loving now than I used to be. I have more joy. If you don't have joy, that's always connected to hope. Maybe you lost the delight of the Father in your life somehow with everything that was, that was hitting you really hard. You know, it's always going to hit us in our identity. It's one of the first places that the enemy tries to bring. If you've lost hope, if you've lost joy, if you're not confronting impossibilities all the time, if you're not regularly pressing into the impossible, if you are critical, if you, even when I was talking about some of the stories this weekend, if there was something, a bit of skepticism that you felt come up in your heart, it's because you're in toil. If you see somebody getting a breakthrough and it leads you to skepticism or like, I have to unfollow this person on Facebook or whatever, you're in toil. Because how, do you, how many of you know that we're a member of one body so that if somebody gets a slice of the pie in here, it doesn't mean that there's less pie. It means that the breakthrough, if somebody finds a breakthrough, you have it. If you're withdrawn, if you're tired mentally, emotionally, physically, if you burn out, if you serve out of duty instead of expectation. Because I know what it's like when you don't expect anything. But when you know that God's about to show up and Jesus is in you, you want to do everything. I heard somebody say, I, was, I saw this meme and it was like, um, uh, do you need the Holy Spirit to go to heaven? And somebody said, honey, you need the Holy Spirit to go to Walmart. <laughs> Does anybody need Holy Spirit in here? Yeah, I'm not the only one, right? If you're not hungry anymore, you're probably toiling. If you feel under attack, if you feel a sense of dread, if you look in any of place in your life and you see hopelessness, you don't see the hope of God, and you're in toil today, and God's inviting you out of that. If you stopped asking for healing, we're going to go after that today. We saw so many healings on Friday, and it was just like that. It was easy. Sometimes it's hard to do that in family because, you know, you're trying to do family really well, and sometimes you lose sight of who God is in us. And it's that tension we've got to live in where we want to be vulnerable, but we want to see God break out. And that Gwen can just as easily give me a word as Mark or Rich or anybody. That's what God's leading us into. Listen, we can go, and I'll show you the scripture. Here's what Jesus said. Would you like this up for me, the next scripture? There it is. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. People like to these days talk about Jesus only in practical matters. And yes, we should feed the homeless. We should build homes in uh, Mexico. We should have clean water in, in Africa. There's those practical kinds of things that we do. 
Except that the works of my father that Jesus is talking about right here are not those things. He's talking about miracles because he's getting confronted with people who are objecting to the fact that, that the father just seems to be breaking out everywhere and healing everybody regardless of what's going on and everything else. Here's where I want to live and I'm choosing to live. And I believe that God's asking us to live. The word of God, the gospel, was never supposed to be preached without God's power actually manifesting. It's actually how, it's how it goes together. It fits. It's, it's one and the same. It's fully integrated. And so what I really believe that God's saying, even in this, is like, you know, I want to live in this place that's like, if, if, I don't, if you don't see God breaking in, I don't want you to even believe me. I don't have anything to talk about. If it's just I'm trying to help you have better character, you can go join the Rotary. You might as well join the Chamber of Commerce, and you can do those good things. But I want stuff that God just like, okay, there is no way except God just did this thing. Marriages are getting back together. Lives are restored. Bodies are being healed. I I mean, all of this stuff. If you've lost hope in your business, in your finances, you wonder if God's actually opposing you, then you're in toil. See, because even in this, this is a story about business, right? It's not just fishing, it's their livelihood. 